Time department chair three times, Sizzle twice, and I'm back half time as a cyber programs coordinator. I work with everything outside the classroom. So I work with clubs, I work with professional associations, I work with our CAE designation. But if you are interested in doing anything outside the classroom, um, I'm very interested in getting to know you and helping you. But it's my pleasure to have someone with me today, um, Clark Rucker is someone who does a lot more than I do. Um, and he has a special passion for mentoring. So if you've ever wanted to have a mentor, Clark is a go-to guy. I've mentored students, but Clark has a full mentoring program through the College of Business. So let me go ahead and bring him up. Get to talking to the box. Thank you. So you got people online? Yeah. Oh, I don't usually use a speaker because people can generally hear me pretty well. First off, I want to say thank you. Uh, welcome. It's good to see you all. I was looking around earlier for familiar faces because I've, I've spoken to the SWIFT group before. I've spoken to FAST team before, and I don't see many. I don't see any, as a matter of fact. In fact, Jessica, I don't even remember you. <laughs> um, so let's see a little bit about myself. Um, I'm wearing a Northrop Grumman t-shirt today. I uh, retired from Boeing two years ago. Um, I do a lot of lectures on campus. I talk to a lot of students. Um, Primarily on the College of Engineering side, but as uh, Dr. Manson just stated, I've just kicked off a mentoring program for the College of Business students. And that mentoring program is going to uh, engage you, hopefully, in uh, relationships with professionals, business-related professionals. So computer information systems professionals and others uh, that you might be interested in speaking with and, uh, and networking with. You know what? I brought a handful of business cards with me today, and I like to have students have my cards specifically for a reason. So if you don't mind, pass those out. If you don't mind, take one and pass it on. I'd like to give you my cards because at some point in time in your career, you're going to need a mentor or someone to help advise you. Maybe resume help. Maybe uh, interview skills help. Maybe uh, salary negotiation help. Or maybe once you've gotten a job like Evan, uh, how to be a value contributing employee to your company. I have uh, talked to students, mentored students, worked with students, and I in fact created presentation packages that I share with students on all of those subjects. And I'll tell you, I've got a pretty, pretty good success rate. About 95% of the students that I work with are successful in negotiating their way into a job or a company. And it's usually at the company or the business that they wanna work at. Why am I here today? As Ms. Dr. Manson stated, um, I engage with students all the time. I, I try to help you guys uh, matriculate to your level of passion, whatever it is you wanna do. And um, been working a lot with engineering students, been working a lot with science, College of Science students. And Dr. Uh, Krishnamurthy, um, I call him Dean K, uh, called me in, I think it was back in February of this year and said, hey, Clark, I want you to start working with the College of Business students. Uh, I think we need to have a mentoring program for them. I think we need them to know that uh, there are people out there that, that are willing to help them, professionals that are willing to bring them on, bring them into the company for internships or jobs, and, uh, and are very interested in the things that you guys are doing. Um, when I go to high schools and, and, and market coming to Cal Poly Pomona, this team was actually, has been one of the teams that I've used in my marketing campaign. You guys won a significant award, what, two years ago? Two, every year, I, for a couple past, last? Runner-up. Runner-up nationally, right? For, in the, in the cyber. National champion. Yeah. CPTC. Who came in second? Stanford came in second. I, I, I want to tell you, I have been using that. OK, I go to high schools because I talk to high school students all the time and try to recruit them to come to uh, Cal Poly. And I tell them all the time, hey, are you, you want to be a computer student? Oh, man, we've got a championship, a championship winning cybersecurity team that you guys need to come be a part of. And, uh, and I tell them a little bit about some of the stuff that you guys have done. Uh, so mind you, I am familiar with your accomplishments. Um, but the bottom line is, as uh, Dr. Manson said, I'm here to help you. OK, 
Um, I, I usually have a presentation that I give to students when I go to meetings like this, lectures like this. And I, did, I have my presentation, but I'm not, that's what we're, not, you guys are not here for that today. You're here for part of the club and, and you're a kickoff. And so I'm gonna let you guys get into that. Uh, I gave you my card. You have extras, those extras? I gave you my card. Please feel free to uh, contact me. Uh, as I say to students all the time, at the bottom of my business card is my email address. That's the best way to reach me. If you have questions about connecting with professionals, if you have questions about how you can connect on um, a People Grove uh, into a mentoring program, if you have questions about your career, your future, I advise every type of student on this campus, including College of Business students. Okay? I want to wish you well in your season this year, and if there's anything I can do, like making donations, which I've done in the past, I will. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome to week two of this year's uh, summer CCDC boot camp. Today, we're going to be talking about business, business injects, just how business relates to the competition, just everything about business. And I know that a lot of people are here because they're interested in cybersecurity and maybe more like technical aspects, but I promise this is really important, not just for the competition, but also just for work and life in general. So this is a very important week to focus on. Um, if you haven't signed in already, please sign in. We take attendance. Um, it just helps a lot for us and for yourself if you're planning on trying out for the team. So please sign in. Uh, the QR code is on the screen and you could also use the shortened link down below. Sorry, it's, it's on my laptop. So yep. cool. All right, yeah, this is where we are this week. Um, next week, we're gonna be doing an uh, intro to networking. And then we'll be getting into like host level security after that. But for now, we're focusing on business. So, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Jess. I was the business lead for the past two years, um, the two years that we took second place uh, nationally. And actually, last year, we took first place in business nationally. So, um, so I'm here to present about business because, you know, that's what I did for a couple of years. Um, and currently, I work at the SOC at SpaceX, uh, doing like detection engineering, incident response, and uh, building some tools and automations here and there. I'm Evan. Uh, I was last year's CCDC captain, and then before that, I was networking in Windows. Uh, I currently work at a small company called Boeing, and I work as a systems engineer. And before that, I was working at a, I was working as an information system security engineer. And so I've done a few things while in school. And yeah, I don't think there's anything else. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Dylan. I'm a fourth year computer science major at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, last year, I was on the Windows team helping Tanai, who is sadly not with us uh, today. And uh, next year, I'm going to be team captain. Um, for other stuff, I'm also going to be the co-director of Swift Competitions. Um, I'm currently a summer uh, threat research intern at a security company called Binary Defense. And I like rock climbing, which is really basic and boring now for like people in tech. It's really popular. I swear to God, it wasn't popular when I got into it like four years ago. Um, and uh, cooking, which is maybe a little bit less basic, but also kind of boring. Um, it's a little. <laughs> uh, yeah, so our table of contents for today is first, we're going to be going over why business is important. Um, generally and also within the competition. Then we're going to be going over um, what role business specifically plays in competitions, which is business in checks. We're going to talk a little bit about Orange Team, I think, and then uh, also uh, forcifications or presentations. And then finally, we're going to have a little uh, in-meeting activity. So first of all, why business, right? Like, um, like Dylan here mentioned earlier, you know, this is a cybersecurity competition. Why are we talking about business? Well, business is pretty important. I I would hope you would know. Uh, but if you're not familiar or ha no one has like given you the spiel about why business is important, well, we function as a, we cybersecurity, we serve as a function of business. What that means is that we exist purely to protect the business. So if there is no business, there is no cybersecurity, right? Like, why do you think 
they're spending money hiring us at instead of like you know spending money on the rockets or planes right it's because things could go really really bad poorly if like our for example internal documents get leaked or we have customers that are very that have very sensitive information that you know can't go out to the public so um, it's really important that we understand where we reside in the scope of the business and I hope that can convince some of you to care about business a little bit more. Uh, but if that wasn't enough to convince you, here's a score breakdown of CCDC. 20% of our score comes from orange team points. So that's also kind of businessy because that's where, you know, you have um, customers try to, you know, interact with your services or they come and they have questions for you. Uh, you have to respond to them promptly and in a professional manner. That kind of also falls under business. And the other 40% comes from services uh, which is, you know, basically making sure all of your uh, services that you're hosting are accessible to your customers. Uh, you know, people can actually access the website, can purchase, place their purchase order and stuff like that. And the last 40% is purely from business injects, which are the tasks that you're given throughout the competition that you have to complete. Um, and these could be tasks coming from your manager. They could be coming from like C-level executives who are like, hey, I need you to move uh, to implement this new tool that we want to try out. Or I want you guys to explain to me why we're paying so much money for this, you know, service. Uh, so, yeah, that is the score breakdown for CCDC. As you can see, business is a pretty large part of the competition. Oh, <laughs> I forgot that that was, yeah. Wow, he's surprised too. He's like, whoa, why is it all business? And uh, I'm going to pass this off to Evan, who has his CISSP, <laughs> so he could talk about the fundamental principles of cybersecurity. Yeah, so there's something called the CIA triad. Um, you'll definitely pop up in your cyber cybersecurity career in the future because it's just so integral to business. And as you'll see, CIA does not stand for the intelligence agency. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And I'll give some examples of why these are important, mainly because, you know, as Jessica said, Cybersecurity isn't your money-making function. Cybersecurity is a loss leader, but if you use it right, it can save you from a lot of loss. <laughs> so confidentiality, right? That's going to be, can you keep your data secure? Um, if you don't keep your data secure, like, oh no, I lost my super important rocket schematics to my competitor. Oop, there goes my competitive advantage. Um, oh no, all my customer data got leaked. There goes my reputation, right? It's not good for your business if you lose your sensitive data. Um, also, another thing with that is your customers really like not having their data sold to random people and confidentiality, you know, keep that secure. <laughs> um, integrity, this one is kind of confused with confidentiality sometimes, but it's mainly the, is your data correct, right? So on the slide, it says loss of business critical information the loss could be in the form of like a sun ray hitting your hard drive and a bit is flipped and now your data is corrupted, right? So you got to have controls to protect against your data being manipulated maliciously either or unintentionally. And so something like that would be um, if I was a credit card company and I was changing your credit card numbers like every 30 minutes, but I didn't tell you about it, you can't use your credit cards, right? And then because your credit card would be associated to that original number. The data's changing, your business isn't working. And then availability, we've seen that over this weekend with CrowdStrike. If you do something that takes down the availability of your services, which is something that CCDC is very akin to, um, you won't have a good time, right? On Friday, CrowdStrike pushed out a patch. A ton of availability went down over the weekend because CrowdStrike is on a lot of things. And without availability, you don't have services, right? What's a business? The cybersecurity services or the actual underlying services providing your business function? Who's heard of the CrowdStrike incident? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Can you mention SLAs in the context of CCDC? Okay. So can you go back to the scoring side? So here, right? You see services is the same like level of scoring as business, right? But there's also a hidden thing called service level agreement. And that's in the context of CCDC is if your service is down for like 
15 minutes, you'll get an extra negative penalty, right? It'll take away like 25 points. Yeah. And one service check is just like one point, right? And so say you have a service down for 15 minutes, you had an agreement with your customer, like you need 99.99999% uptime. Oh, you're down for five minutes, you breach that service level agreement, they're gonna charge you some money in the CCDC, they're gonna charge you some points, right? So one SLA in CCDC is equivalent to like 25 service checks, which is a lot of time and a lot of points. And a lot of times you'll see some of the newer teams in CCDC kind of forget about SLAs and they'll end up with negative thousands of points because of it. What and some decisions you have to make as captain regarding like SLAs? Some decisions I have to make as captain regarding SLAs. So, you know, sometimes we have to make sacrifices to orange team <laughs> because it's a little lower on the percentages, but you know, our customers also want to use our services rather than be talked to sometimes. And so some things that we would have to do would be like, oh, you know, five services have been down for 15 minutes. Uh, someone get on that. And if someone says like, oh, I'm working on this other task. It's like, how urgent is it? How much is it worth? Right? So it's all a balancing act. And just like real life, you're kind of balancing your inputs, right? Yeah. Um, is this cyber attack going to be more consequential than if my services are down for 25 minutes, right? Like if Microsoft has DNS down for like a minute, there are like millions of dollars lost right there. So yeah, service level agreements and business functions are very important. Do you want to talk? I mean, I feel like we've already got, okay. We've already kind of gone over this, but yeah, the whole point of security is to support the business. Like I said, uh, cybersecurity, generally, unless you're uh, working at a company like I am that like outsources cybersecurity to, to like other countries outsource to them and like pay us to do cybersecurity stuff. It's generally an expenditure and not a way to make money. Um, so we have an obligation to uh, just support all the business functionality. And that's kind of the whole point of the competition and also just like what you would do in the real world. Um, yeah, we'll talk about, uh, I guess, Orange Team um, and just other technical tasks. So basically within uh, CCDC, uh, the way that the competition is sort of set up is that you are supposed to keep services running for the duration of the competition, um, but they also are constantly giving you tasks, either in the form of written business injects, um, spoken and presented business presentations, or customer interactions, like phone calls where you have to change someone's password, or someone, some customer walks into your room and wants to know some information about how your uh, company network is set up, and you have to address those things um, too. Business injects aren't always necessarily just write-ups. They can also affect the way that you're operating. They could request you to move where services are. They could tell you that they're no longer supporting a certain operating system or like a certain like hypervisor for your VMs and you have to take all the services down on those. So it's constantly changing the way that you're sort of working within the competition. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, more technical aspects, it's not always just, like I said, answering questions. Like I said, sometimes it can be like service migration, like it mentions below in the slide, like migrating stuff to and from cloud. Um, and uh, also just answering technical questions that hypothetical, hypothetically non-technical people like your hypothetical manager in the competition are asking. Um, you know. So the key takeaway from the slide is literally just, you have to be as flexible as possible in, you know, understanding the task and what they're asking for and really pivoting really quickly to be able to answer to like multiple levels of different people, right? So like, uh, sorry, I almost called you Mike. Dylan mentioned earlier, um, you could either be, you know, answering to your hypothetical manager, um, maybe on a more technical level or your hypothetical C-suite executives who are like, why are we spending money? And you have to like be able to adapt to their, their asks and, um, you know, kind of give them what they want. Cause like you, you have to convince them that you're an expenditure that's worth spending money on instead of, you know, on other things. Um, and yeah, you, it requires like a pretty broad understanding and cooperation from the team itself. Right. So sometimes obviously one person can't complete all the tasks that, you know, they assign you. So for context, 
uh, for our like two day competition, we had like at some point 40 injects over like eight, two eight hour periods that we had to reply with. Um, and that includes the technical task itself, but also a technical write up of explaining why we chose the solution that we 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 took or the approach that we took. Um, you know what that the timeline of that would look like implementing that change across the company, uh, what that would cost us, right? Um, and you know whether or not it requires like further maintenance from other people and stuff like that. And you also have to provide like good reasoning, right? So. It's a really heavy task and it's important that everybody on the team understands why we have to like try our best to respond to these business tasks and not just the business person, which is really something that our team was really good at. Um, whenever I, I a new inject came in, I would just assign them to certain people. Like I'd be like, hey, Mike. Oh, sorry. Hey, Dylan, <laughs> please give me. <laughs> please give me evidence that you did this thing. Right. So like, oh, take screenshots as you're doing this task, right? For example, uh, we're migrating our database to the cloud. Well, I need thorough documentation so I could write about it and insert. We call him Mike because um, because there used to be two Dylans on the team, and when we say Dylan, both of them would look up. And and so and so the other Dylan started calling him Mike, so so that's why his name is Mike. It's because my last name is Michalik, so it kind of sounds like Mike. Oh, you, oh, wow. Yeah, it's a common issue. I've never had that problem though. <laughs> um, But sorry, where was I? But yeah, I'd be like, hey, Mike, please give me all the screenshots. So by the time I'm done writing the reasoning or writing the documentation on how we, you know, approach the task, I could have evidence backing it up. So, uh, we're going to go more in depth about what injects look like in the competition. <laughs> so what is an inject? An inject is a business task, right? And you're like, what's a business task? That's so vague. Exactly. Um, a business task in this concept of CCDC can be anything, right? You thought you were hired on for a security team? No, you're also hired on to be the IT support team. You're also hired on to be the um, compliance team. You're also hired to be the security team. And so you do a lot of things in these business tasks, right? So what does it look like? Basically, you get a hypothetical email from some random C-level executive and they'll be like, <clears throat> uh, I have a task for you to complete. As it'll be like, um, someone told me that we need firewalls. Can you compare three different firewalls and tell me which one is the best one, right? So now, you have a certain time frame to complete this task. So in like an hour, research three different firewalls, right? We'll see, uh, we can just use our host-based firewalls or like, oh, we can get a Cisco firewall. Oh, we can get a Palo Alto, right? Research it, come up with whatever you can to support evidence, right? Uh, Palo Alto website says it'll cost this much. Cisco website said it'll cost this much a year. Uh, how do we support it, right? Get all those considerations in. Then once you've written your report, to whatever C-level executive requested this of you, then you just email it back. And it's like basically a business transaction with your company leadership, but you have no idea what the task is going to be. And it can literally be anything. Do you want the secret sauce to get Inject? Sure. <laughs> um, so like we mentioned earlier, we actually got first place nationally on Inject. I had to keep flexing that because you know, it's cool. Uh, but <laughs> this is the secret sauce or the takeaways that, you know, um, our team has discovered after, you know, doing well. Sorry. Um, but the most important thing uh, for writing good injects and, you know, getting the points that you deserve through this competition is, first of all, be thorough. You really have to read the prompt very, very, very carefully because, you know, sometimes they'll ask for, um, like Evan said earlier, please compare three different firewalls, right? But if you didn't see in the fine print, like, hey guys, maybe we have an allotted budget of this, or maybe we, you know, uh, don't have the technical support to be able to maintain like X, Y, Z, right? Um, you have to know that and take that into account. There are some like very specific asks that they will ask of you. So sometimes they're like, oh, we, we want to host um, this service or like, for example, what's a good one? 
oh yeah, we want a file share, but we need it to be, um, what was it like domain joined? Yeah, domain joined and it has to have multi-factor authentication, right? So th that's one of them during a competition that I was like working with our Windows guy, um, Tanai on. Um, but we saw the fine print like in the middle of our research and we're like, oh shoot. I don't think the two, like two of them that we chose have those requirements and we have to go back and like, you know, re, re do research again. Um, but it's really important to catch those things um, when you're, you know, reading the prompt. Another thing that's really important is to use clear and concise language. The easier you make it for the judge to be able to see like what you implemented word for word. Um, and this is why we really like to provide supporting evidence. Those two kind of go hand in hand because if you have screenshots showing them that you did the task, they don't have to go the extra mile to like, okay, do am I sure that they did it? Do I have to go in and verify that, you know, um, you know, they actually migrated the service or that they actually tried three different types of VPNs. <laughs> um, and so you really want to be able to convince them that you did the task, right? Uh, and show supporting evidence for it and make it really easy for them to see like, okay, they actually went through these steps. Um, these were some of the roadblocks they encountered and yeah, just make it easier for from a business perspective, it's also make it easier for your higher ups to understand that you actually did your task thoroughly. So here is an example of an inject that we got a few years ago. So this was a hypothetical situation where you know we worked at a um, at Swiss Bank Exchange, which was like a what was it like a FTX? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This was during like the whole um, like FTX thing, but yeah. Uh, so if you read the prompt, it says, hello team, I hope that you're taking inventory over assets and that you're making notes of what software was being removed and what ports were closed in the process, right? If you haven't done so already, uh, I want you to perform an audit of any unnecessary softwares and, and services that are running on our systems. And then um, you need to provide a list of unnecessary software. That's the deliverable, right? What ports were closed and break this down by the host that they were discovered to be running on. So immediately you could see that I've highlighted some of the key points because CCDC does this a lot, um, especially at our regional level. I think nationals is a little bit better um, at being clear and concise with what they're asking, but I think at the regional level, they intentionally make it super long um, and they put a lot of unnecessary words in there to try to throw you off. Um, but immediately you could see like the key takeaways, right? Um, they're asking for an audit of the unnecessary software and services. Um, at the same time, you have to remember the first line. It's like, if you already started like uh, administering some of these systems and you've already removed um, some of the software that you found unnecessary, for example, maybe you logged into your uh, machine and you saw there was a Minecraft server running and there's no reason a bank should have a Minecraft server, right? So you already removed it. Well, you do have to go back and you know make sure you make note of that, right? Um, and let your um, higher ups know. Um, and then at the same time, they're asking for you know what ports are closed and they want it to be organized by the host that they were discovered to be running on. So then this is also another objective that you have to meet in your deliverable, right? You have to like organize it the way that they asked. Um, so uh, a quick thing that I like to do is just like immediately start writing down what they're asking for because uh, when injects are released to you, they're often released to you in bundles. I don't, the competition is really mean for doing this, but they'll release like three or four injects at the same time. And then you as the business person, or even if you are not the business person, right? You have to be cognizant of what they're asking for, um, for each task, right? And some of these like have overlaps and they seem very similar. So immediately I'll start writing down like what each task is and who I assigned the task to. So for example, I'm like, okay, Evan, can you do this? And I'll just give it to him. But at the same time, I don't want Evan to have to read the whole thing again, right? Like he should, but before he does that, like he could start getting a mental note of like, okay, what this inject is asking for. So I like to break it down into like a few bullet points that he can immediately digest and start working on. Um, but yeah, always, always, always while you're completing the task, right? This is for those who are, you know, thinking of joining the team. Maybe you're not going to be the designated business person, but you still will have to be doing a lot of these tasks, right? So you always want to make sure that you're taking notes on everything that you've done. Uh, make sure you have thorough documentation so that later when you are able to organize that report, all that information is already there. You don't have to go back and take screenshots again. Um, huh? 
Oh, okay. Yeah. You want to say anything? Um, um, I also would like to point out that it's really, really important, even if you're not the business person, to be very proactive in trying to take on injects. If you're not actively doing anything, there's almost always going to be some sort of inject that's incomplete and worth points. And right, the way the competition is set up for, uh, at least for regionals and nationals, is you have two eight hour long days. And besides just like keeping your services up within those days, your main goal, like at every moment of that competition for the whole time should just be maximizing the amount of points you're making at any given instant, right? So if you're not actively addressing something that's mm -hmm. gonna get you points, you should be working on a business inject because that will surely get you something. Yeah. Okay. So another really important thing in business injects, especially because um, the people who grade it are really trying to take the approach of this is an actual business simulation and they will take a po points away for saying like using unprofessional language or doing anything that sort of uh, removes from that experience. Uh, it's really important to address the person that uh, in the business inject you were sent, there'll always be like from X person maybe their title, it's important to address them correctly. Um, it's really important to take into account who your audience is. So if you're getting an email from, if the business inject is coming from like the, I don't know, like the the security, the hypothetical, like like uh, head of like the IT department versus like the CEO of the company, the way that you write the inject, the amount, the kind of information that you're going to share and details that you're going to give are going to be very different, right? On one, it might be important to describe like the, Technical, it might be more important to focus on like the technical aspects of whatever task you completed. Whereas for the CEO, it's going to be really important to try and describe like the important impact of whatever you're doing on the company as a whole um, and get to the point. So like besides the fact that you just have a very limited amount of time to complete these tasks, um, it's really important to uh, also just make them as clear and concise and well formatted as possible so that they're as easy for the uh, white team who are the team grading the injects to grade so that you can make sure you get as many points as possible. Um, yeah. So the, the opposite side of all those things I just said is like, don't use colloquial language. So like, don't use slang, don't address them casually. Um, don't neglect formatting because like they won't enjoy grading that and they'll probably remove some points. Um, and don't uh, guess about information. If you're unsure about something that you're writing about, uh, you have seven other team members. One of them probably knows better than you. If you don't, so it's really important to collaborate with other people. Um, so like, even if you're assigned an inject, so let's say uh, write about, I don't know, um, some network traffic analysis tool um, or like a uh, packet a security tool, like I don't know, like, like snort on your router and you don't know, really know what it does. Um, it's probably worth it to like ask your team if anyone has a better understanding than you so you can get that information to help you with that report, right? Um, yeah, the next thing is it's really important to provide supporting evidence. You're trying to convince whoever gave you the, the inject that whatever solution you came up, whatever response you gave them is the best one. Um, so the most important thing to get points is to provide information. So whether that's screenshots of a service you set up for the inject, uh, sources that you referenced when answering some sort of question, um, or whatever format it is, um, honestly, the evidence that you provide is just as or more important than what you write in the inject. Um, in order to get points. So uh, an example of this would be perhaps like a cloud migration, right? They're like, okay, here are three different um, cloud solutions. Like there's GCP, AWS, and Azure. Which one would we want to migrate to? Or for example, another one, oh, like an actual one we got during competition was um, choose the best like hypervisor solution for our company, right? And so you have to com like compare not just, you know, pricing, um, like resource usage, uh, but also like, for example, um, whether or not there is some sort of solution that already exists on, on your uh, network that you could just immediately implement and it would be a quicker solution, right? So you wanna make sure you also provide like external evidence to back things up. For example, uh, for pricing, you're like, okay, well, this is the different pricing models for each of the solutions that you uh, are asking for. Um, so that's like, for example, if your, your boss is asking you, so then you'd have to convince them like, okay, this is probably worth the money if you think that that's the right solution. Right. Um, and then on the flip side, it's like, 
you also have to take into account like, okay, if you ha your team had to implement it. So maybe it is the best solution, but maybe you don't have the expertise on your team to implement the solution, right? So there's a lot to take into account and you have to read the prompt carefully so that you understand like what the ask is specifically. Yeah, so on more on providing back supporting evidence, uh, you can always think of just like pictures or it didn't happen because that was most likely the best way to show evidence is a picture of it happening. And so typically how we provide evidence or the forms of evidence, right? You give background on the issue. So that's, that's a good example. I think in terms of our hypervisor example, some background on the issue we gave was that we already had some hypervisors running on our network. And so we gave like pictures of the hypervisors and kind of what that meant in explanation. Um, and then like why you choose a solution, you also need evidence for that, right? Uh, here's evidence that our team is better at using um, ESXi instead of Proxmox, right? And for our hypervisor solutions. Um, how much does your solution cost? Yeah, that is also just evidence you can find online. Um, typically in competition, because we aren't really in an academic setting and there's not much time, you can kind of just find whatever you see online. Uh, if it looks credible, right? If it's from like yourname.com and just like a blank sheet with the number on it, right? It probably is not great as a resource. But if it's from like, you know, the company saying about how much it will cost, that's pretty good. Even if it's just an estimate. And then another big part about supporting evidence is, you know, can you show that you can implement your solution, right? A big part of our injects, like maybe a half to a third is just steps of us showing ourselves implementing the solution, right? That'll just be screenshots of our terminals, screenshots of the GUI showing that we're on a website, just like any evidence that you can show that whatever you implemented is working, they'll take it, right? And we'll take it too. And then going back to the background. So for example, uh, different businesses have different compliance requirements. I know I said the word compliance, not a lot of people want to hear this, but uh, for example, if you're a bank, you have to meet certain uh, requirements with, you know, the government entities that govern you, right? So it's like, oh, you have to make sure you have host level firewalls implemented on your systems. That is part of what would like keep you within compliance of the framework that you have to align with, right? For example, PCI DSS, right? So if you didn't implement this solution, there will like the government will fine you. You will there will be a stoppage to your business. So this is another thing that you can add into your inject that would give it more context and more body, right? So it's like, yes, we need to spend the time and the money to implement this fix, especially because the business can directly be impacted by this, you know, with fines, loss of reputation, maybe even a stoppage to your business, right? So uh, this is another example of how you could give even more background to the issue and make your argument a little bit more sound. Yeah, so this is essentially what we just talked about. So things, examples of evidence, specific ones would be like screenshots of what you're doing, um, logs, uh, either copy and pasted or screenshots of logs, um, examples of a configuration for a service you're setting up, um, showing what scripts were run and what they're doing. Um, and it's also really important to uh, categorize the evidence. So for instance, if there's an inject that's asking you to uh, record all the services running and separate it by uh, all the services running in all your machines, you wouldn't want to just give a laundry list of uh, different services. You'd want to have by machine what the operating system machine is running, what services are on that machine, um, and do it in a neat way like that so they can very easily score it and make sure that you're correct. Yeah, and even when it doesn't ask for a specific organization format or anything like that, um, it's always good to just include it, right? Um, chances are that you'll be scored on that or, you know, in real world, someone likes organization more than they like a blob of text. And so it's good to get in the practice of just providing organized text to your, whoever's asking things of you. This is also very important outside of the competition now that we're working in the industry. Um, when Whenever we implement changes, um, within our work environment, we have to provide proper documentation of what changes were implemented. For example, uh, if Bryce were to write a new detection, right, he would have to like write comments 
about what the detection was for, what maybe, for example, what inspired his um, his detection, for example, maybe some new exploit came out and he's like, okay, well, this is in response to this CVE um, or what gaps that this fills and what are some like requirements for the, the detection to fire correctly, right? So what are some logs that he absolutely needs, right? So that maybe, for example, he's out on a sick day or he's on PTO, uh, the alert fires and people are confused. They have something to come back to look at, right? Um, and it's really important. And for me, like, you know, I'm just getting onboarded onto a new team. And if if they didn't have proper thorough documentation on their their processes and the things that the tools that I have to use, I will literally be useless until someone sits down and walks me through everything. Right. So it's really important, not just within this competition, but outside of your um, when you're you know, you're actually working in the industry to, you know, have this good practice of like showing your um showing documentation and like making it concise uh, with a lot of things backing it up. And so here are some takeaways that we got from, you know, competing for, especially Evan and I for so many years now, uh, for Inject specifically, organization, again, organization is key. Um, and this isn't just within the Inject, this is within the team. So for example, um, some, like, like I said earlier, you can get hit with three or four Injects at a time, right? And they're all for different tasks. So maybe a new, like one of them comes in and it's like, uh, I need you to evaluate three different VPN solutions and which one is the most fitting for our environment. At the same time, I get another inject that's like, hey, we need to migrate our databases um, onto our cloud provider. Like what, you know, document that that uh, process and X, Y, Z, right? So I have to keep in mind, okay, I assigned the first one to Evan, I assigned the next one to Dylan, but who who's gonna back them up, right? Like for example, maybe something goes down because Evan was our, our networking lead as well. Um, if something bad happens on the to our router, right? We need to make sure we have backups, right? We, we have to make sure someone else can take over Evan's task. And part of that is also good documentation on the inject side, right? So if Evan just hops off that inject and someone hops on, they can immediately look at what Evan has done and just pick it up from there. So we're not wasting time. Another thing is everyone has to contribute. It is absolutely impossible for one person to complete every single inject with quality and submit it on time. This is just not possible. Even with a team of eight people and with everyone helping, it was really, really difficult. Um, and so if you are thinking of joining the team, you have to know that this is a basic task and responsibility expected of you. Um, to be able to contribute to Inject, And always read the prompt. This is not just for the business person, but also to the person assigned the task. And we often have a system of, hey, I found the Inject, I like, or I, I received the Inject, um, I identified the person who's probably the most suited to respond to it with their expertise. So for example, I pass it off to Evan. Well, Evan is starting the Inject, but he also has to read the prompt to make sure I didn't miss anything. And then whoever else is checking his inject before we're submitting it also has to read the prompt again um, to make sure we aren't missing anything. Because those are easy points that you could just miss. Do you have if you have a situation where someone might be afraid to ask for help because they might be embarrassed by that. That does happen around like the start of the year, right? The, the first initial competition, some of the new team members are more shy, right? To speak up because, you know, Kind of intimidating being near people who've been in competition for three or four years, right? Well, yeah, around, you can totally tell it's gone by like the second day of regionals. Like they're just like going. And so that's nice to see every time that it happens. And that can happen during the invitational. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be more embarrassing not having an inject turned in because I didn't know what to do than asking a team member for help. So I think it generally got done even for like the newer people. During the nationals, historically, it was very good for a few years. They went to nationals, they were in first place throughout the competition into the last one. I ran WRCCDC from 2008 to 2017. Berkeley won regionals for a few years. One year they went to nationals, they were in first place. First day, they were in first place. Second day, they were in first place up to two hours before they finished. They missed turning in an inject by five minutes. Knocked them down to second place. It can, it can happen. It can be that important. 
Uh, for context, like Evan was saying, uh, SLAs are 25 points, and we're saying, oh, that's a lot of points because that's 25 minutes of uptime, right? Um, th these scores might change, by the way. This is based off of previous years. But uh, your average inject is worth 200 points. So each inject that you miss is a lot, a lot of points. And this could determine you know, whether or not you're first or second place or if you even place at all. All right, um, the next session is gonna be about uh, what used to be forced vacations, but are now, they're, they're a lot shorter, so they're not quite vacations. It's like short outings, um, which are uh, the presentations that you have to give several times each competition. <laughs> Hold up, vacation? Never mind, they change it to 15 minutes instead of an hour. So basically what presentation injects are is um, you will be given uh, just a normal business inject, but instead of asking you to do some sort of task, it's going to be asking you to present on a topic. You'll generally have about an hour to do whatever research on the topic you need to, put together some sort of generally PowerPoint presentation, um, and then you're going to go to a separate room from where the rest of your team is competing um, and stand in front of a bunch of uh, people on the competition white team or maybe sponsors or just whoever's in there in general and present on your topic. And after you're done with your presentation, um, they're going to be asking you a bunch of questions about you presented on to try and see if you actually know what you're talking about or not, and sort of know what the goal of your presentation is uh, supposed to be. So uh, the, the joke of the start was, uh, I, I never had to experience this because they changed it last year, but it used to be you would be dragged to like another room for like two hours to... Uh, wait while everyone goes through their presentation and then give your 15 minute presentation and you wouldn't really have any communication or be able to help your team for that whole time. Um, last year at regionals, they changed it. So uh, you only have to be down there for the 15 minutes when you're presenting and then you can go back with your team. But it is still a good amount of time that you're away from everyone, especially in the context of just an eight hour day. If you're doing two presentations a day, that's like 30 minutes. That's like what, like one sixteenth of your time. So that's like a pretty significant amount of time away. Um, uh, yeah, it is a pretty important skill. Um, not necessarily, uh, you don't necessarily have to be, uh, ha have the most insane PowerPoint or like the most insane information, but you do have to somewhat have an idea, know what you're talking about and be able to confidently present that information in a way, um, that not only gives, uh, accurate information and evidence, and you can accurately answer the questions that are asked of you. Um, but it also makes it seem like, you know, what you're talking about, because if, you have all the right information on your slides and you did all your research, but you get in the room and someone asks you a question and you like are like really wishy-washy or you just kind of make it sound like you're unsure. Like that's going to be a lot worse than uh, just being confident in the way that you present yourself. I think presentations now more than ever are really important to acknowledge. Um, it, it is a skill that is really important to the team. It used to be um, the responsibility of the business person at least in our team that's how it was formatted or allocated i guess so whoever's business would pro would be you know practicing delivering presentations and being comfortable with this but now we've kind of changed it into more of a whoever's free has to go take the presentation because your business person is probably very busy writing injects um your captain has to be in the room because they have to be leading the team and giving them direction throughout, you know, the tasks that may may be uh, assigned to you. So it's whoever has the most free time on their hands has to go in for their presentation. So what that means is that you have to be able to digest information really, really quickly um, and be confident in the its delivery and also be comfortable with presenting to a room of judges. And this might not seem like a fun task right off the bat, right? Nobody likes public speaking. Nobody likes presenting, but especially not on a topic that you only had an hour to review. Sorry. Oh, you like it? Oh, come on. Well, then you would be perfect on our team. But uh, yeah, a, a thing is like, the thing is like, you have to, you have one hour to familiarize yourself with the slides, not only your slides and th your topic, but how that fits in, in the context of your environment, right? So for example, um, one of the tasks that they asked of us last year was like, Oh, how are you, like what services are most fitting to be migrated to the cloud, right? So you have to understand exactly what within your network 
is um, you know easily migrated, what kind of like security implementations you have to consider um, after that migration and a bunch of other stuff, right? So they're gonna be asking you from a business perspective, like, oh, what, what are some steps that you've already taken? Uh, do we need to hire a new person to come take over this? Who on your team has that kind of expertise, if not, right? So there's a bunch of things that you have to answer and you just have to be confident in giving you know, a proper delivery. Um, so this is something that you have to keep in mind if you wanna you know, be a contributing member to our team. It's, uh, it's pretty important and presentations are worth a lot. They used to be only worth like a couple hundred points, but I think we've uh, kind of expressed how ridiculous that is given like the the size of the task. So I think it's balanced more properly now. So it's even more important that you are able to deliver your presentation well. Um, another reason why they're more important is we took like high school, like econ or like, you know, like opportunity cost means, like I said earlier, the whole goal of the competition is you maximize the amount of points you make. So back when you had to abandon your team for two hours, um, to earn the same amount of points as every other inject, it relatively wasn't as important as it is now, where you just have to be there for 15 minutes and it's worth generally more than the other things are worth. Um, so in terms of the actual presentation that you create, um, a good way to impress the judges is to make it organized. You don't want to just go into PowerPoint or LibreOffice, whatever you're, you're making it with, and just open up a bunch of blank slides and write a bunch of words um, because that's not going to be a good presentation. It's going to be hard to, to follow along. You're going to want to keep it really organized. Use some sort of uh, template or format for organizing your information. Uh, no long sentences, so keep it to short bullet points and graphical information as all the actual uh, details that you're going to convey should be coming out of your mouth, not off of the screen. Um, you're going to want to uh, maybe show, like I said, graphics. So even if it's not like, specific graphs with like data, like things to look at to help keep people's attention. Like we have here, we have these nice little uh, images on the screen can help make a presentation a lot more appealing to the people evaluating it. Um, as well as if you're presenting on a technical topic, like you're presenting on uh, your company's use of, I think the one I did was snort on our router, um, having like screenshots of that, like user environment to show that it's actually set up and doing something is really important. Sorry, do you have a question? Um, I don't think, can you? I mean, I think you can take notes, but generally I, I think I just presented off of my head. Uh, I would just spend like a good amount of time looking over your, uh, I mean, also your, your presentation kind of like act as notes. So uh, you should always be able to refer back to remember what you're supposed to be talking about. Um, and like we said, it's sort of just whoever's available uh, and also whoever has the best knowledge on the topic, whoever's available. So, um, yeah, I mean, like you could take notes, but generally I don't think you need to. Um, and uh, yeah, sources are also valuable. You don't have to have a source for like everything you say, especially if it's like general like IT knowledge. But if, for instance, you're presenting on like a specific, uh, for the example that I've been giving, currently like the snort configuration. If you wanna talk about how you're using like a specific rule set, you would wanna give where that rule set's for, why you chose it, like the source that you got it from, um, as well as like any less general knowledge you wanna cite a source for. Snort presentations last year, Coco, and there was some really good questions coming out from the judges. And sometimes the judge is the last question that might try to throw you off. So one of the questions was, have you considered doing this? Have we considered doing that? So how do you handle something where you come up with what you think is a solution, but they're asking you to consider things you didn't consider? Um, I mean, you can answer too. Generally, generally what I, I think I remember some of those questions, but generally what I would do would just be like, we didn't look into that specific uh, solution. Um, I can't give you like a specific answer, but then sort of, sort of reiterate the justification for why you went the direction you did and uh, why it's a good idea. And uh, yeah, just sort of confidently describe um, why you think that it is still a solution to the problem, I guess. And I think generally the most important thing is just to be honest, because when you start making things up, uh, and they start prodding you, it falls apart really, really quickly. 
so just be confident and you know you're doing the best that you can just answering everything that you know for sure go ahead, keep going. Oh, okay and oftentimes when we're presented with like hey pick between these solutions uh we have a quick team discussion on hey is anyone familiar with this anyone comfortable with it because we have to implement it on our end as well so there are justifications uh you know, to the question that was an example, like, why did you do this? Why didn't you consider something else? Well, maybe it's because someone on our team already has an expertise level in this solution, or maybe this is something that already exists in our environment or something that we've worked with a lot in the past. So even though maybe it's not the cheapest solution, it is something that we're confident that we can implement well, right? So there's a lot of like little nuances there. Yeah. Suggestion. Thank you. As a uh, as a former director of quality at the Boeing Company, I gave a lot of uh, presentations and became very comfortable with them. And and the question that Dan just asked that a competitor a judge might ask you guys, one of the ways that I found that was um, probably one of the best ways that I could answer that question is, well, we really didn't have time to investigate that particular solution, uh, but, but we think it's a great idea and we're gonna take a note to go investigate it in the future. So a, a lot of the times what you, what you what that does for the person that asks the question is it lets them know, it validates that, yeah, they asked a good question. And it also lets them know that you guys thought it was a good question. You're gonna spend the time to go investigate it. So that's one thing I just wanted to share with you. And, and granted, everything else that you said about how to address that question, perfect, fine too. I'm just giving you how I used to answer those questions. Second thing I want to share with you and with the question that was asked in the room uh, about how do you become comfortable with your presentation material, really the bottom line about doing presentations comes down to two things, knowing your audience, knowing your material. If you know your audience and you know what they're or can expect what they're going to ask you and, and want to know about what your presentation material is, then you're, that's half the battle. The other half of the battle is knowing your material. And if, as I always say to students when, they, when, I, when I try to uh, prompt them or prop them up to get ready to speak. Uh, if you know your material, you will be confident and comfortable with presenting your material. N no one knows as much about the material that you're about to present than you. So all you got to do is present it and just talk like you know it. Generally, you're going to be successful. I might have to take notes whenever I have to do internal presentations too. That The first, like validating their their question is like, I feel like that's really important. Uh, and, and like he said, uh, oftentimes you will have more senior members on your team. You can talk to them about, you know, what sort of questions are often asked. Uh, our team has really good documentation on the things that we've had come up in the past couple of years. So from there, you can also predict some of the topics. Um, and yeah, and oftentimes before we go in for a presentation, we will look at our slides and say like, what are some things they can poke holes at? and just try to address those before we head in for the presentation. So that's another way to just feel a little bit more confident. Yeah, yeah presentations during the competition are a very collaborative effort and much more than the other injects just because of the nature. And so we typically have like two or three people look at it before and that typically gets a good knowledge base down for whoever's presenting, but yeah, just also be expecting that you must be able to co like cooperate with other people that's very important all right yeah so how to impress the judges um i never had to give my own ccdc presentation because i was just like keyboard monkey but so being loud right if they can't hear you in the back of the room typically it's a pretty big room so you have to be loud luckily i have this microphone uh <laughs> So yeah, speak with confidence. It says riz them up. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> Just speak with confidence. Act like you know what you're talking about. Um, fidgeting, right? You're like moving around, jiggling a little bit. Um, stance tall, right? Good posture. Project your voice. It'll be good. And then eye contact, right? Typically, there's like a panel of judges. So you're not really just staring down one person, right? You're looking around the room looking at everyone, everyone's going to ask questions, right? So it's good to build up the eye contact rapport with them. But yeah, judges will like that. You know, they're not the harshest of graders, but anything you give them to give you a higher grade is accepted, right? One last note is generally you're going to be bringing your laptop to the presentation room, uh, putting on like some sort of podium and then giving your presentation. 
um, don't stay in front of your laptop staring at it. Don't like be here, like looking up at the judges and like looking at your slides. You want to, if possible, if you feel confident enough, step out in front of the podium, wherever you put your laptop, uh, stand in front of the judges. That's a really good way to look confident, look like you know what you're talking about um, and sort of get their attention because they're going to pay a lot more attention to someone walking around talking to them as opposed to someone reading from their computer. All right, so uh, we've reached our activity portion. So good news, you're hired. Bad news, you might not want to be hired at this moment. Um, why is the sound not working? Yes. Um, OK, let me mute myself. <laughs> Sorry, this was supposed to be more dramatic than that. I think only people on Zoom can hear it. Oh, shoot. Then I just, oh. <laughs> OK, so scenario. Who here has heard about the CrowdStrike incident? I already asked that question earlier. But so imagine you're working in a SOC. Uh, imagine you're working for a bank, right? Um, CrowdStrike pushed their update. Now all your Windows machines are bricked. Oh, no. You got the alert. You, you're up at 2 AM. It wasn't playing on Zoom. Oh, well, oh, you could imagine a paging noise. Um, so your manager is now awake. He's on the way to the office. Before he gets to the office, you need to put together a quick technical report, um, like a flyover of what happened, what caused it, right? Everything he needs to know so that he could, you know, go ahead and interact with the IT people that are going to be trying to implement their fix. So um, do you want to add to that? I think I covered everything. I don't know what I'm adding to this. Okay, <laughs> Yeah, so starting now, you have 30 minutes to put together your one-page report. Remember, this is to your manager who is technical. He uh, just needs a basic flyover of what happened exactly, right? Um, from a technical level, why, you know, why did CrowdStrike break our computers? Um, and then also, what are some immediate fixes that you can implement, uh, or maybe not so immediate, as you will see when you research? Um, so give that, give the technical details on that. And also any takeaways that your, your company can learn from this, right? What are some things that you could suggest uh, in order to prevent something like this from happening in the future? Um, it doesn't even need to be perfect, but whatever you have in 30 minutes. So at 2.36, make sure that it is submitted um, to the link that uh, we have on screen. Yeah. Um, Good luck. Get going. This is so relevant. <laughs> we really got lucky that a good event happened this weekend. I was driving and I was like, oh, I know what the activity will be. Yeah, and this kind of thing is exactly what CCDP does. Something big happens in the last, like, two weeks leading up to the competition. You can expect an inject on it. Or two. Yeah, or two. The link is now in the Zoom chat for the person who asked. Yeah. I'm, I need to. Uh, we'll be walking around and like trying to figure out why your or how your research is going. Oh. Can you show me how to use the link shortener? Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have your laptop? Yeah. No, I, I want this to be in the middle. It's like, it's not bad. It's okay, we'll call it. Huh? What are you confused about? Oh, how do I do this? Is it good? Oh, yeah, copyright. Oh, yeah, do it again. Just submit without like the press. Dude, no way. It's just a brother. Uh, guys, I'm T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, she sent the thing to like emails. Oh, they're.
Does it matter? Uh, they have to log in. Oh, shoot. Yeah, let me just... I'll just change that real quick. Yeah, yeah. Oh, can you change it? Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, because it's it's on the system. Don't make it What'd you say? I was in the Yeah, so it's on the left. So, you know, you're going to get you the way so. Like 
No, I think that's just pretty simple. No, this is what I'm talking about. Oh, it's like very I've heard a lot of that. When they're receiving, you could just say, now they're in. More like if I follow her. Okay, but the actual functionality. Uh, uh, like, yeah, it's like, 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 it's it's just a game. Check the hash of the game. Yeah. Like, like, it's like, still game. Is it still gaming? Oh, it's still gaming. It's still game. Oh. You gotta play green stuff. Yeah. I did. So I gave him the good stuff. He also wanted to check. Yeah. Yeah. He also wanted to check. Yeah. Uh, you say both ones? Uh, I never knew that. So, anyway, good to meet you. I don't know where the rabbit is. Anyone on the SPC? Good to meet you. Again, as I said, anything I can do to help. Oh, yeah, you can do You can do it. Uh, advice I can give, like some of the stuff I talked about in speaking, or whatever the case may be, I'm here for that. And then you're going to hear more. You guys are going to hear more from me about the mutual program. I'm upset about that. Uh, but that's our I want to get you guys connected. Other that's just a good So you're writing this as a report. You don't really have to directly address your boss, but it's going to be like a hey, on this day, this XYZ happened, right? So kind of like a brief uh, report. They were all there. I literally made it. Okay. I'm a, I'm a software developer. I just like called. No, no, just, yeah. Well, that's kind of one, like an actual Maybe it maybe pretend to be a user that's like I don't have to I mean, it's okay. It's, it's more the spirit, right? I just think it's like it's more fun if it's like well, in the context of Oh yeah, don't. Just, just like don't. Just like, yeah. Why would you do that? I wouldn't, but like if it's <laughs> whatever, I would just like make sure I don't like with fast okay. and someone's bottom. Do you want me to announce that <laughs> to your customers? <laughs> Wait, what? Do you want me to announce this? <laughs> like some of your clients or some of your your users are are really upset as well. That they might be coming around asking you questions. Is there a water one? Yeah, but just for the just for the people like here, unless I want to drag people into the like rooms on just be like here, I'll, 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 I'll. just go around. Well, it's announced here and then I'll like send people around that question. Hey, so we've got a Troy question for you. Mm -hmm. We've got a senior here from Troy. And first of all, is it okay for High school students will drop in here. Oh, um, in online only, I think. We only could pretend to. Oh, we don't have to. He's not supposed to be here. No, oh, no, no, but. Oh, it's it's if you're it's if you're eighteen. Okay, so the other question is, what about the club meetings during the year? Do you have to be eighteen to go to a club meeting? I have no clue. Um, we have a form for that. We have a form if they want to do that. But like yes and no. 
Is online it? is easier so they don't have to fill up the form. So online there's no worries. But if they want to touch him in person, they need to have a form. There's a media release, right? Media release, okay. Mm -hmm. Which is fine. We've done that before. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, is it because they'd be on camera? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you know they're developing in middle school. Now. The talent is developing in middle school. You know how many middle school students are playing having a major in books?
This is your 10 minute warning.
The inject is due in three minutes. I'm your manager and I'm pulling into the parking lot. I better see those reports on my desk. You're so comfortable doing that. <laughs> I'm practicing. Yeah. I want a physical copy on my desk. <laughs> That's what happens at the beginning of CCDC. You're replacing. Uh, Rachel, I I don't see it on my desk. Why are you lying to me? Which desk? I have many desks. Fax. You mean a facsimile machine? <laughs> Sorry, I I've not. Fax. That's crazy. The printer broke. Why is the printer always broken, bro? Someone fix it. Do printers ever get hacked in CCDC? Good point, Dr. Manson. Printers are also targeted during our competition uh, in CCDC. There have been instances. The dog ate the report. Well, that's crazy. I don't see the report on my desk, so I'm going to have to have you guys read out the report. Starting with Rachel, could you please read your report out to me? Uh, sure. Me, Rachel. What Rachel, you I need your report, please. Yeah. Rachel, are you muted? Hello? I hear Rachel, I cannot hear you. Oh, my God. Oh, wait, oh, I'm, wait dumb. I'm dumb. Wait here, let me just, where's the? Can you try talking again? Hello, hello. Okay, yeah, that works. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel, uh, we're having technical issues. 
All right, Rachel. Speak. Can oh, I have no. your report, please? Thank you. I can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, dear boss, I am writing to provide an update on the recent server-wide issues experienced at Insert Bank, which has been the result of a malfunction related to our endpoint protection system provided by CrowdStrike's Falcon platform. This morning, we encountered a significant delays due to a widespread server outage. The root cause of this issue was a critical failure triggered by a recent content update from CrowdStrike, which was introduced, which introduced a major bug affecting Windows hosts. CrowdStrike's Falcon endpoint system, which le leverages artificial intelligence and analytics to detect threats in real time, experienced a failure on 7 19 2024 20, at 12 34 p.m. Falcon operates at a low level within the operating system using background drivers to monitor for anomalies. However, the update deployed last night by an employee, which contained faulty code, led to a worldwide outage across all affected devices and is not specific to our company. The operating systems that are affected include Windows hosts, but macOS and Linux systems were not affected by the outage. Following the update, the systems booted into safe mode, which caused delays in restoring the operating systems to normal. This incident was not related to any cybersecurity attack. And the resolution was expedited thanks to CrowdStrike's quick action to comprehensive backup protocols, which facilitated a swift recovery. We are actively working with CrowdStrike to ensure that such issues are mitigated in the future and to prevent similar disruptions. Thank you for your understanding and patience as we address the situation. Should you require further details or have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Best regards. Thank you, Rachel. I think now I have a much... Rachel, your team is very, very proud of you. They're all clapping. Um, Yay, thank you. I, can, I think I can go into this meeting with our boss a lot more confidently now that You've given me such a concise report. Any other eager employees want to show their, um, you know, their their report? Help our cause. Help me before we face our boss, who's going to ask me why we're paying two hundred thousand dollars for a tool that breaks our systems. I, I need your help. In the room. No one wants to help me. You're all getting demoted. Please. I'll start calling on people. Justin? Justin, you are our CrowdStrike representative. You have to show me your report. <laughs> Wait, I need to I need to pull up my, my document again. Uh good morning, manager. I have attached a technical report below on the incident that occurred in the SOC today. On July 19, 2024, a software update issued by CrowdStrike for their Falcon Sensor Vulnerability Scanner caused widespread system crashes on Windows machines globally. The flawed update included a faulty driver, Channel File 291, which triggered blue screens of death and boot loops, making affected systems unus unusable. The incident disrupted numerous critical services, including airline operations, banking systems, uh, media broadcasts, and emergency call centers. Uh, CrowdStrike released an update to the Falcon Sensor Vulnerability Scanner on July 19, 2024. Uh, the driver was found to contain only null bytes. While the null bytes did not directly cause the system crashes, they were associated with a logic error in the Windows kernel that induced continuous boot loops and system crashes. crashes. The update impacted millions of Windows computers worldwide, leading to blue screen of death and boot loops. These issues rendered systems unusable and required manual intervention to resolve. Uh, so the impact here is as of today, 200 of our Windows machines at the Bank of Terrestrial Weapons are bricked and stuck in a blue screen of death. CrowdStrike provided a fix for the update. However, due to the boot loop, affected machines could not apply the fix automatically. So in order to remediate the 200 machines that were bricked early this morning at our bank, it is recommended that we boot each system into safe mode or Windows recovery mode ensure that local admin access and BitLocker keys are available for the affected systems, and manually delete the channel file 291 driver. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. I really appreciated hearing about how many systems were affected and you know how we could remediate it. Anybody else want to add context to this incident that we're facing that is you know, causing our business to die? No one? 
Nat? No? Um, oh, we have a volunteer. <laughs> my, my report maybe it's not the best for, but like, <laughs> should I read it? Yeah, go ahead. Um, dear manager, today, all of our Windows machine are break due to a recent update on a part of our security software made by CrowdStrike. The part which is this factor is the Falcon sensor that can detect attacks in real time. On July 19th, they pushed a new update to Falcon sensor, which contains a programming error that will crash the Windows system kernel. This problem only affects Windows machines. Automatic, automatic recovery solution can be deployed if this Windows machines are, are on public cloud. Manual solutions are also possible with access to these machines and BitLocker key if enabled. Um, uh, this is a problem that requires immediate attention as all of the Windows computer are forced into a boot loop and unable to be used. Um, it also requires each one of the 200, 200 computers to be fixed manually one by one if it's not on public cloud. Disruption of this incident made it impossible for the bank to be operating. Therefore, it is advised to start the recovery process as fast as possible. Thank you, Joe. You, uh, our team is very proud of you as well. You wanna... um, is that a good report? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, we'll, we'll go over more in detail like um, in a little bit, you'll see. Uh, do we have any last volunteers? All right, well. Well, as your CEO, I really appreciate the reports. I don't know, I don't know why we have CrowdStrike anyways, if we're wasting our time like this. Um, you know, I don't know why we have IT either. You know, they're so slow with everything, wasting our money. I think we should we shouldn't use computers anymore. But anyways, oh. Damn, I don't know I set this up. So our CEO, wait, you, you time traveled. Now it's like 8 a.m. Your CEO woke up and he's like, why are we paying for this? Why did something that we pay for that's supposed to protect us? Like this whole time, you guys in the stock have been telling me, you know, you we're paying for CrowdStrike. It's going to protect us. We're not going to have outages. Like we're not going to get hit with ransomware like the MGM did, right? Like when all of their computers died. Why are our computers dying now? So now you have to write another report uh, to brief your CEO and your C-suite. So like upper level people in your company, this is gonna be a more business oriented report focused on numbers, focused on statistics about why it's important to still pay attention to security, why you know this one incident shouldn't deter you from making security a focus at your company. Uh, this is also a very real problem. Uh, I feel like a lot of socks this weekend are trying to find justification or a lot of like security professionals are trying to help justify why it is more is still important for companies to pay attention to to us and to continue to fund our efforts so you have another 30 minutes to write this justification anyone have questions before it's on my desk Um, William. William Billiam. That's my middle. I mean, that's my last name. What? Yeah. Yeah, 
That's 30 minutes from now. Did you look at the 18? Uh, 18 minutes. Did you look at the at all? Yeah. 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 Do you guys have any questions or anything that needs to be clarified? Yeah, so there's a new link for the submission. It is the same shortened link at Justice H, but instead of week two, one, it's week two, two. Uh, and it's due at 3.18 PM, half an hour, or 3.16, sorry. Very interested in learning more about our um, or yeah, yeah you are the I'm director of focus with this company, so I'm planning to answer this I 
Okay. You know the uh, the thing you really like now it is the cloud native conductor. So let's say you're running on containers or anything that's you know just uh for less fiber. Are you gonna use this cloud for you know less? I don't think I'm not sure. Um the container size is much different on the printer, so I'm gonna find a way to that or the uh internet connection and that's what you're going to do. You want to do a count, you're going to have to do a lot of money, and also, um, you have to do a lot of money, and you have to do a lot of money, and you have to do a lot of the highest role by proxy. You want to add that to that bandwidth, you know, the 24-7 threat up there, when you guys are sleeping, go on. They definitely, of course, have a point. Sometimes, uh, they also on it, they also have an AI power of the data. Yeah, that's true. Yeah,
Yeah, and so you're saying like we need to use our own steps. They can't be in person. So it's just like we don't need their team because you guys need to be in person. What about like when this is all over and they just fall over and they like the blue screen is all gone? Why are we putting the green screen when they can still tell you that you're going to be in the future? Um, hey, Alexander. Alex Chacon. Yeah, hello. Hello. Yep. Are you working at the SOC? Uh, I currently am, yes. So, so can you explain to me why I paid for you to work here and to secure my computer? Specifically to prevent this kind of thing from happening. And then you recommended me a tool that I should pay for in addition to you, right? I'm paying for you and this tool. And then now this tool broke my computer. It's doing the very thing that I didn't want it to do. Why? Yes, yeah, so, um, actually, this is kind of like a one-off thing. This kind of thing doesn't really happen all that often. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to explain uh, the necessity of an EDR to you if you have the time. Yeah, I'm listening. I I want to know. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, with the recent outage of many of our systems, you know, you're obviously wondering why it's necessary for our company to have the CrowdStrike Falcon platformed installed on many of our computers and servers. So essentially what this program does, is it effectively stops hackers from getting into our systems. And it's essentially the best endpoint detection response um, system out on the market. So currently we're spending $184.99 uh, per device annually, which comes out to about $36,988 for our 200 Windows devices that were affected by this bug. That's a very expensive mistake that we made. It It is, but it's n compared to an actual breach um, associated with a hacker, like of our, of our systems, um, it's actually like really minuscule. So according to Sentinel-1, data breaches cost the finance sector an average of 5.9 million per breach. Um, and this number not only includes like ransomware payments, but it can also include things like forensics analysis and investigations, investigation fees, um, PR crisis and management fees, and uh, legal expenses and customer compensation. So um, although we've also like never really have gotten hacked before, um, the main reason why we have never gotten hacked um, is because of this product. Um, this product uses cutting edge technologies like AI and machine learning to keep our company safe from the hackers. And it can detect behavior that is malicious in our systems and get the hackers out before they're able to cause actual harm to our systems. So, so then if I'm already paying for this really good tool, why am I paying for you as well? I mean, so you need to have people that know how to use the tool to be able to use it effectively, right? Let's say if a hacker did get in and did end up getting past that endpoint detection response, um, you would need someone to get them out, right? So to to be able to use this product effectively, you have to have people like us on the SOC to be able to manage it effectively. It's not as easy as plug and play. There's things we have to configure on our end to get this to work across all of our systems. You know, that makes a lot of sense, but then I'm also confused as to how you chose CrowdStrike. Like, why am I paying for a company that has its own car? Like, they're they're clearly not focused on just doing their job. They have a car. I mean, yeah, that's, um. I mean, yeah, their, their F1 car is pretty cool, but that's mainly for like marketing. There are also other vendors like Sentinel-1 that have um endpoint detection response systems. Um, we could look into those options if you're not happy with this CrowdStrike system, but I'd really recommend this one just because, you know, it's on the cutting edge of technology using AI and machine learning. Um, it's really effective at what they do. Um, like I said, this is kind of like a one-off thing. I don't imagine this happening again. Hopefully it doesn't, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to think that CrowdStrike has the best EDR platform out there. So then you wouldn't recommend us switching to a different tool? No, um, us switching to a different tool will cost us a downtime. And, um, you know, obviously the downtime associated with this bug was really bad and we wouldn't want, want to have that um, happen again. We'd also probably need training um, to use another EDR platform. All of our incident response team is like pretty well versed in CrowdStrike uh, Falcon. So, yeah, we'd probably need some training that would cost us lots of money associated with, you know, acquiring a new endpoint detection response platform. 
So yeah, um, I just think the associated business costs would not be great um, for us to switch to another EDR platform. You know, that makes a lot of sense. I see why I hired you now. Thank you. Thank you. I love working here. I'm sure you don't really love working here right this moment, given that you have to respond to 200 dead machines, but. I love my job. We also have no health care or stocks. And I'm paying minimum wage. That's okay. At least I'm getting paid. I do. I do it for the love of the job, not for the money. I'm keeping you, but I'm not promoting you. That's okay. You guys have two more minutes. Oh, four more minutes. Does anyone else want to justify their their salary? Molly Chen. Uh, hi. Um, I'll pull it up. Sorry, hold on. Okay. Um. You. Uh. Good morning, CEO. The SOC team understands your frustration with the recent crowd strike outage on our Microsoft machines. The irregular incident was due to a software update disrupting Windows processing. Nonetheless, CrowdStrike has been an essential protection tool, and once our current machines are fixed and remaining problems are mitigated, it is essential we continue to utilize it. CrowdStrike is one of the highest rated antivirus softwares because of its endpoint detection and response. This system detects threats, comprehensively tracks the details of their actions, and helps our team to respond. The precise scale to which endpoint detection brings to the table is irreplaceable, and the manual tracking of constant threats would be severely inefficient. Regards, SOC team. That, I, I guess that makes sense. But like, how much money are we spending on this tool? Is is it worth the cost? Um, it is most essential to our systems. Um, with any company, an antivirus is always needed, especially at a very important company like ours. And I would suggest that we uh, absolutely continue to use CrowdStrike. You know, I think our company is pretty important too. I agree. You have two minutes to submit your report. In a PDF format? You're kidding. I'm waiting for people to make.
All right, your reports, I believe, should be submitted. So does anyone want to justify the existence of their team against our C CEO, William Billiam? I'm waiting. Hello? Ransomware attacks cost more than Archbrook's own problems. At one point, the change is extensive. It's kind of hard to hear you. Your voice is really mm -hmm. deep. Take your time, Roberto. No, uh, that's a tuba. That was a tuba. You can hear that. Hear what? When you were like, that's a tuba. They heard you. Oh. Okay. Mm, who should I pick? Who do I pick? Raymond. Let me get you the mic. Oh, we just read my uh yes, can you justify why we use an EDR? Um well from a basic standpoint, um we should continue using an EDR because it ensures that our sense like information or data being transferred mm -hmm. between other um um devices or computers are secure and we wouldn't want uh some hacker to attack our company right so we would need crowdstrike a platform like crowdstrike to be implemented in order for incident like cyber attack incidents to not occur Do you have any further questions, sir? William, William, Mister? Huh? Sure. Oh, okay. It's kind of short but concise. Wait, what was that your report? Basically, yeah. <laughs> right. Are there any alternatives to CrowdStrike or any other EDRs we should use? No, CrowdStrike is uh goaded. I don't know what gold it is, but yeah. <laughs> anyways, I'll take that off of your paycheck. Anyone else? What else? Didn't she go last time? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> What is, or why should we use an EDR? Um, security should always be a focus for businesses because there are regulations for banks and companies offering financial services such as GDPR, SOX, PCI, DSS, BSA, and GLBA. 
which if we violate those regulations, it could end up end up costing us more money. Additionally, services such as CrowdStrike provide protection from outsider threats to make our company more secure. Having major attacks is costly. And the University of Georgia or the University of Northern Georgia notes that the average cost of a data breach in 2020 will exceed $150 million and in total could cost up to over $200 trillion in 2019. Without security, a business fails to function and it can cause major downtime to impact our company's productivity. There are different security options aside from CrowdStrike. However, it is the best option for us um, because CrowdStrike is cloud native, which allows us to stay on the cloud and it's AI powered. It also has a 24 hour threat hunting services, which allow our, us to monitor our security. If we move to another service, the company will have less productivity. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Uh, we have another person wanting to justify their existence. Anyone else? Stop. Or is Roberto? I think he wanted to talk earlier. <laughs> Who doesn't want to get fired? Is Roberto ready? Oh, Roberto, are you are you ready? Or do you want to talk? Oh, okay, that is that's unfortunate. Um. Well, I think um, keeping an EDR software as CrowdStrike to effectively and efficiently detect security threats and vulnerabilities is essential to our IT security team. As you are well aware, our internal security team is small and we need to outsource some of our functions. CrowdStrike, it's able to scan through operation, operations logs and security events a lot faster and more efficiently than our small team could possibly manage. They handle potential vulnerabilities faster than mm -hmm. us. They also identify true threats and notify us right away about any security incidents. The role of CrowdStrike CrowdStrike to keep both our financial and customer data safe is vital for the good health of our institution. The cost of su subscription to CrowdStrike outweighs the potential cost of losses associated with loss of trust from customers, bad reputation for failing to protect our customers, PII, or sensitive financial data loss. The use of CrowdStrike in our, in our in our organization enables our team to focus on mitigating and minimizing real threats to our security systems and act faster. If our team had spent endless hours going through all the operational logs and monitoring traffic produced by our systems, we would need to hire more IT personnel. <laughs> Thank you. I love saving money. Yeah. Eric, you're up. Hey, thank you. Yeah. So mine's like an MMO format. So hello, CEO. My name is Eric Rodriguez. I'm the subject matter expert in endpoint detection and response here at insert bank name. I'm writing this memo to offer guidance on the next steps following the latest IT outage experienced, experienced worldwide as a result of a faulty content update hello. pushed out by CrowdStrike last night. As the SME here, I want to emphasize the importance of using an EDR system by offering enhanced visibility and rapid incident response capabilities, EDR helps our organization mitigate risks, investigate threats, and contain security breaches, thus safeguarding our network and devices from advanced cyber threats. Although our company suffered from this company-wide outage, losses incurred are minuscule when compared to the potential losses from a cyber attack. The current cost of maintaining the CrowdStrike Falcon sensor within our company uh, as a form of EDR is approximately $184.99 per device annually, which comes out to approximately $37,000 annually for the 200 devices. Although losses incurred during the outage caused by the faulty software update are still unknown, the use of CrowdStrike's EDR platform has protected our company for the last four years, ensuring that losses from cyber attacks did not occur. Potential savings from the use of CrowdStrike's EDR platform range in the millions of dollars, 
as a typical cyber attack on a banking institution incurs an average loss of $1.6 million. CrowdStrike has time and time again proven to be the most efficient and trustworthy EDR platform with an average mean to a, an average mean time to detect of four minutes, which is six times faster than the leading EDR platform from Palo Alto and Microsoft, and 11 times faster than Sentinel One. With CrowdStrike, customers benefit from better protection, better performance, and immediate time to value delivered by the cloud native CrowdStrike Falcon platform. I also want to bring awareness to the fact that training costs for using an EDR system are very expensive, as these tools are highly complex and require a large, dedicated team to be able to effectively use. If we were to decide to switch from the CrowdStrike EDR platform to a competitor, costs associated with switching would include both software costs and training costs for our staff who are already trained on using the Falcon EDR system. As the SME of bank name, I recommend that we continue to use CrowdStrike's EDR as the pros heavily outweigh the cons. I also recommend communications with, with CrowdStrike begin to gain insights into how this outage occurred and gain reassurance that this issue, that an issue like this will not happen again. It is also in our best interest to document our losses and report them to CrowdStrike so that we may negotiate a discount slash deal with them to make up for the losses we incurred. If you have any additional questions or concerns, do not hesitate to reach out. That's it. That was really good. Um, very, uh, very long, but I think it was still good because all of the, uh, like there, there wasn't a lot of wasted words. I think all the uh, details that you shared were, were relevant. So I, I like that one a lot. All right, um, I fixed my mic to sound better now. Oh, yeah. Um, do you want to go now? Yeah. Okay, so dear CEO, the cost of global cybercrime in 2024 is $9.5 trillion US dollars, with an IBM study finding that 11% of organizations experience ransomware attacks, with ransomware attacks costing more than $30 billion in 2023. That crowd strikes endpoint detection and response software, which uses AI to track things such as process creation, driver loading, registry modifications, disk access, memory access, and network connections, we'd be leaving our servers along with our data vulnerable to ransomware attacks, which could permanently cripple our ability to market ourselves to potential customers and could lead to a full compromise of our credential leading to legal uh, uh, suits from customers, potentially losing even more money and causing us to go bankrupt. Even with the freeze and the loss of money, it is very minimal compared to what a cyber attack would cost us. And with the cost of CrowdStrike being only... 50,000, about 50,000 per year for a thousand endpoints, it'd be worth the cost. Best regards, Roberto. Nice, really brief and concise with relevant details. Um, does anyone else want to go? All right, so let's go over the differences between the two reports. Uh, I think before we go into detail, there are some things that I want to point out uh, that I noticed. So I think uh, some, th some things that I want to highlight was, uh, Nat, when you included the, and I think some other people did too, um, the cost of fines if we're not in compliance, especially as a banking organization, uh, if we're not in compliance with the entities that govern us, like PCI, DSS and stuff, uh, the fines incurred from that could actually be more heavy than, you know, um, not having proper cybersecurity at our company. Or sorry, what was I saying? Oh, then, then paying for this tool, sorry. Um, but I think one thing I wanted to highlight for the C-suite one was that I don't think anyone gave a proper timeline of how quickly we can remediate this threat, what that would look like, any like overtime hours, like how many employees we need to bring on, stuff like that. Um, even if it's not super detailed, we still do need an estimate of like, okay, how much money are we going to spend to fix this? How quickly can we fix this? Can we get our business back online? Because as like as a C-level exec, like that's all I care about is when can business resume as normal? Um, so I think it's really important to highlight that. But on the flip side, uh, for those especially of you who highlighted like the cost of maintaining CrowdStrike um, and how effective it is, I think that was really important to give more context uh also backing it up with like previous incidents and uh, spe specifically examples within like the banking realm like oh how much it costs uh on average when a cybersecurity incident occurs and i think that's really good to give it more context 
Um, do you guys have anything to add? Um, sorry, I don't know if you mentioned this in like the past 10 seconds when I was quickly writing another message, but I really liked um, the example about talking about the uh, training costs of transitioning to a uh, different EDR. That's really, I think the big thing is that using switching to a different platform, you have to retrain all your employees, which is like an insane amount of money um, in time that could just be spent continuing with the current service and just hoping and just hoping that they fix their their problems and something like this doesn't happen again. Do you have anything? To I think um, it's it's a lot easier to write the more technical rundown because that's like you know di digesting that information, uh, making it maybe under a little bit more understandable for the manager. But um, when you put that like when you have to you know take a different perspective and start explaining to like C level execs or from a more business perspective, um, what what happened and how to fix it and stuff, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to kind of remove yourself from this role and think of things from their perspective, right? Um, so what they're gonna care about is like, when can we resume to normal, right? When can we start making money again? Why was this task difficult? Like, why is it difficult for us to get our systems back online quickly? Um, why is it worth it for them to continue paying for a cybersecurity team if you're literally causing what you promised to prevent, right? And for the future as well, this is important because like they have to continue paying for it. You have to justify your continued existence, right? Um, and I think it's really important to give context about how CrowdStrike's reputation was before this uh, occurred to justify why you went with this solution, right? Because I'm sure when you ask for this tool to be paid for, or this is how things work, right? Like you are suggesting a tool um, and you have to give, example, or give justifications on why this tool is so much better than the other other tools, other options, for example, like Sentinel One or Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. It's like, why did we end up choosing CrowdStrike? Well, it's because of its reputation, right? We didn't expect this kind of thing to happen. Um, and I think what's more important is to give an even bigger picture example or perspective, right? Because you're not the only company affected by this. There's hundreds of companies across the, the, the world, um, like flights, that are being grounded because you know their flight software is now bricked, right? Or um, you know banks, other banks not being able to process transactions, even down to like you know grocery stores not being able to, you know, um, use their the credit card payment system. So everything has to be cashed. Like we're not the only company affected by this, and it's important to give that perspective to your um, your uh, higher ups. It's not just your problem; it's everybody's problem. And this is not something that you could have prevented, right, at your level. The manager perspective is a little bit more technical. He probably already understands what CrowdStrike is, why this product was chosen. Um, he just needs the immediately actionable steps to get your, your systems back online, right? Like he just needs to know who needs to be coming into the office, what needs to happen, how difficult is this fix? Do we have to bring in other teams like IT, which of course you do, right? Um, can you expect the user to remediate this themselves, right? Um, how are you going to go about doing that, right? And any actionable takeaways from this incident? So for example, it's like, well, could we roll out um, EDR updates to just, you know, part, a portion of our systems instead of throughout the whole network, right? Um, I guess for CrowdStrike, um, this was less of, a, less of a user error, more of a CrowdStrike problem. Um, but there are things that you could do, like negotiate with them, like, hey, why was this not tested first? Why was why was there no, you know, like, uh, I think was it Eric who brought in like the amount of losses we incurred from this? And you can use that to debate um, or to, to kind of like, hey, can we lower our costs because you guys clearly didn't do your due diligence and it's cost us this much money? There's probably also a service level agreement. Yeah. There's probably also like we like happens in the competition, the service level agreement that CrowdStrike likely has with the people paying for their services so that they could hopefully get some money or at least sue for it um, if a lot of losses do occur. And on uh, and on a like team team like level, right? There are takeaways from this as well. Like before we roll out any major changes to software that is applied throughout our company, uh, maybe we could have a test pool first, right? And not roll it out to the to all of our computers because 
Um, even though in this case it was out of our control, it's one of those things where as a team that has to do similar things, implement similar changes and roll out um, updates constantly, uh, it's something that you could keep in mind, right? It's like, hey, we don't want to make their mistake. So any questions, anything to add? Or any, Evan, you want to add something? Um, so I think the takeaways are pertaining to like, the question was, was this, these comments pertaining to the, like C-suite level or manager? Um, I think it's always important to add takeaways to whenever anything happens, just to, to, just to prove that, you know, you've evaluated the situation. Your team is like actually learning from this and it wasn't just a mistake that had no upside to it. Um, but yeah, and then a more breakdown is like on the slide of like what, maybe different approaches that you could have taken with the two reports. I think the most important thing in uh, responding to, or yeah, in, in a task like this is to put yourself in the perspective of the person that you're writing it to. In their role, what do they need to, to know immediately um, for them to do their job or for it to be beneficial for them to have that meeting with you? Yeah. <laughs> There's another injection. I want to take a start on. Okay. Yeah. Oh wait. Should we explain the types of those? We explain what. Okay. So, um, in this activity, you're obviously given a very limited amount of time to actually do the injects. Uh, if you go to the link that you can currently see on your screen, um, and just type it out. It's a really short link. Uh, that will have this week's homework, which is due next Friday. It will be uh, graded pretty strictly on the index, making sure that they're answering all of the uh, requirements that we've provided. So if you missed anything um, that we pointed out, make sure to revise that for your homework submission. Um, obviously, we can't like you, we can't like tell you have to do all these injects in like less than an hour because there's no way we can track that. But try not to spend like a ton of time writing them because that's just like not an accurate representation of what the competition will look like. Um, so the homework submission, I believe, is the two injects that we've done today, um, as well as a, another one that's in the homework document that you will all be uh, sort of putting into PDF format and then putting in a zip file and then uploading to the submission portal on Canvas when you're done with all of them. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it has details in the document, but just make sure you review the notes, review the slides from today. They'll be available, um, on our site as well as on the discord. Um, and just make sure they're as solid as possible. Use professional language, concise, and they have the answer all the questions that are asked. Yeah. And for the two uh, activities that we did today, feel free to, you know, improve on it before you submit it as yeah. your homework assignment, because we're actually going to be grading those. So uh, everything we discussed today, hopefully it could help um, help you make some positive changes to your two reports. But um, yeah, this is a very common like CCDC type task. Uh, you always have to be taking into account like um, multiple perspectives from multiple people that you might be reporting to. So hopefully this helps gives you a little bit more bit more context on what's expected of you as a member of the team in the future. Uh, sorry, you had a question. Like you want to like ask whether or not they're they're good. Um, I mean, if you have like any specific questions for us, you can ask those on the Discord. I'm a little bit hesitant to like give you specific feedback for the whole index before you've like submitted as a homework assignment. But like all of us are willing to help if you have any questions um, about like specific parts, as well as I'm sure like other people in the boot camp can like you're like you're allowed to collab. Like obviously, we don't copy each other's stuff, but like there's nothing against like collaborating and working together to like check each other's work, right? Um, another thing that I'll say is that, uh, I know that for a lot of people, maybe like the business injects might feel like tedious or boring. Um, I promise like the, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be going over like a lot more technical topics. Um, but just keep in mind that it is like really important in all the work that you submit and all the stuff you do in the competition that it is in like a professional business format. That's kind of why we prioritize this week first is it's sort of like framing everything else you're going to do. 
um, for the rest of the boot camp and in the competition if you join the team. Um, so yeah, don't get if this wasn't particularly your favorite week, I would say don't get just don't get discouraged from continuing. Um, other stuff is going to be, I think personally, like for me, a lot more interesting. Um, but yeah, it is it is important, so don't neglect it. It's called important. Yeah. No. <laughs> Uh, also like canvas. Um, what about the canvas thing? Like, so we need to resubmit upgraded versions of the reports along with the three injects, the third inject. Uh, yeah. So it says what your deliverables and how you should format them um, exactly should look like on the actual um, homework document. But just to reiterate, it's going to be all three of the injects. So the two we did today collectively, along with the uh, the extra one that was given. Um, you're going to format your responses in individual PDFs. You're going to put all those PDFs into a zip file. You're going to archive them. And then you're going to submit that zip file with the naming convention that is specified in the document to the Canvas portal. What do they do if they don't have Canvas? Oh, if you don't have Canvas and you don't attend Cal Poly Pomona and you want feedback, um, you should DM it directly um, to me on discord so my discord tag is val karma um i'm on the i'm in the ccdc discord it's it's on my shirt um so yeah just send it to me and i'll give you feedback if i have extra time um in a competition setting how long would you suggest to work on these injects um i think this is a pretty light inject in comparison to the ones that we typically get in a competition setting, because I think if this were to be applied in competition, a more likely inject would be like, these are the three EDR solutions. Why did we choose CrowdStrike? And then like implement them, the one that you recommend, something like that. So there's going to be a technical aspect to it in addition to the write-up. Um, and it's going to ask you for more than just one tool, right? Um, the difference is uh, like, you have the whole team with you. You have people that could take certain things. So the way that our team did it last year, uh, and this probably varies between each team and like how people work with each other, but usually uh, I'll probably break it up and have one person research one thing. And then I'll be the one like aggregating all the information at the end and like, you know, making it all like concise and pretty and all that stuff. Um, but you'll probably be given like an hour for something like that. So it's, it's very much a team effort. I think that's the key to, you know, doing well in business is making sure your team understands that sometimes that is the priority and they have to like, you know, be willing to help out. Um, so the term inject is specific to the competition. I've never heard, or I've never had the term thrown at me in a professional setting. But it's it's akin to like your manager asking you for something. Yeah. I think we just call it injects because like you're in the middle of competition. And for a lot of new teams, it's really easy to just focus on the competition itself. So the first year that I competed, um Evan's first year as well, this was like three years ago. Um, and we basically ignored injects because we it it was like an optional thing. Um, so we were always, yeah, in our minds it was optional. We were like, eh. It's a cybersecurity competition. Why are they telling us to do things, right? Like, why are they asking us to write reports? We don't want to write reports. So we would we would literally like harden our systems to no end. And we're like, oh, we're still doing our 30 minute checklist. Well, we don't want to touch this inject, even though that's completely not necessary, right? So it took some time for us to like adapt um, into respecting the role of the business person and the injects as well. Um, but I think that was a key change to our success because that first year when we ignored injects, we placed eighth place in the region out of eight teams. <laughs> so dead last. Um, and then the next year we went on to nationals. So that shows just how much of an improvement we've made. And it's not just, you know, because we started taking injects seriously, but that is half of the score, right? So that's part of it. I've got some word for word inject prompts that I've seen in the competition at work. So another oh sorry 
Oh, it's okay. Yeah, we could come back to your question. Um, building off of what Evan said, I think especially now that like we've had some work experience, it's okay. Templates. So, so this is an in interesting question because I think every team does this differently. Uh, so the question was, do you recommend using templates? Um, I'd say it's not necessary, but when I took on the business role, uh, I was really bored because, you know, there's really not much to prep for aside from like researching possible inject scenarios and then pre-writing certain things or, um, what else did I do? Like researching compliance regulations and like, oh, well, these things would come in handy if they asked me about this and I can add this as a source, right? And I got really bored. So I started like um, scripting out a lot of my templates. I don't think that's necessary. And I actually like bit me in the in the, in the the behind my first year because I wrote all of my scripts uh, for like G Suite. So like Google Docs. Um, and then they removed it from the competition the day that we started, like literally the day that we got there, they're like, oh, we forgot to make um, Gmail accounts for you guys. So you have no G Suite. And I was like, oh no, all my injects are going to be blank. So it's like, I guess don't like put too much of an emphasis on it, um, but it does help a lot, especially for us. Cause I have a lot of like tables and all that stuff scripted out. So I don't have to go in and like manually click things but like, that's about it. It's not really beneficial. It's kind of just, I was bored and I wanted to do something else. Um, At most, it makes it look nice and may give like some psychology points to your writing because it looks better than it is. I think it, it's good because your templates had me put the inject number at the top before I started writing it so that I wouldn't forget what inject I was working on in the middle of the inject, which is really useful. <laughs> I'm glad it helped you. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say is that I think, although this is probably arguably the most boring part of the competition, like writing reports and all this delegation, it's pretty boring. But it is, it's been the most transferable skill that I picked up. Um, I mean, aside from the fact that you always have to like, you know, deploy random tools across your environment, um, that's very real to the business, at least where I work, we have like new things all the time. And part of like half of my job is just like automating things when I see it. So it's like, that's very transferable. But I think even more than that is like being able to argue why it was important for us to take that task in the first place, which is directly the skills that you learn from doing business injects. Do we have any more questions? So the question was, what do you recommend having on a template? Um, so the ones that I made, I had like multiple things. So I had some that uh, had like tables and stuff. So there's certain injects, like if you get like an inventory inject and they're like, oh, what ports are open on what hosts? Like then you can have all the tables already ready. You just have to plug in the numbers, which is nice. Um, I usually have like a header and a footer so that it looks a bit more professional. So usually uh, if the competition has like a logo or something, I'll plug it in. Like the fictitious, the fictitious company uh, will probably have a logo. So I'll just pull it from the inject and I'll just put it on the top of the template. Um, yeah. And then like, like Dylan said, there is the, I put like a number field and a name field so that people can, you know, not forget to do that. Um, I don't know. I, it depends on the inject. I think if you join the team, you'll have access to all of this stuff. Yeah. Sorry, that's probably the yeah. Templates aren't that complex. They're just yeah. Any other questions? But yeah, I think we are right on time to end this off. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Uh.